Yeah, so we are in the middle of a collective psychosis. And the Native Americans have a term, um, the Watiko virus, it's a mind virus, that's actually at the bottom, at the root of the collective madness that we're playing out. And it's at the root of the, of the evil that is manifesting all throughout our world. And so I'm just in the role of a translator um, in the sense that, and it, it was based on my own unbelievable trauma that I went through. I'm in, I'm in my mid sixties now when I was in my early twenties that um, basically um, precipitated this direct encounter that I had with archetypal evil that almost killed me. And it, it totally drove me out of my mind, um, you know, which isn't a bad thing, really, out of my conceptual cognitive mind. And it destroyed my entire family. And so I was forced to confront this higher dimensional force, this darker force. And, um, and it wasn't just playing itself outside in my world, but it also had a correlate inside of my own mind. It was non-local. And um, it, it, was, it was a nightmare for a number of years, but the whole while I was cultivating awareness and I happened to be having a, the, the encounter with the darker force with Watiko really catalyzed a spiritual awakening that began to happen, an over-the-top spiritual awakening in which I began to recognize that we're having a dream, a collective dream. And so I was in this weird state of having a direct, like a close encounter of, of the Watiko kind, you could say, with this darker archetypal force of evil, and at the same time having a spiritual awakening. So I was taking notes and I was drawing maps and trying to understand what I was encountering. And it was, I realize now I'm still unpacking what went down and what I experienced and it radically changed my life. And more and more, I began to realize I was having a revelation, an over-the-top revelation of something that was secretly encoded within the fabric of the universe, as well as within, and not just my own mind, but within mind itself, within all of our minds. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today, um, is this mind virus, the Watiko mind virus. It's been called the topic of topics in the Castaneda books, Don Juan refers to it as that. He doesn't have the name Watiko, um, but you know he's pointing at exactly Watiko and every spiritual tradition. I mean, I've written one classic book about Watiko. I have two more coming out. The first one is about how every spiritual tradition and creative artists and thinkers and philosophers, every single one is pointing at Watiko just by a different name. They're articulating it in their own creative way because it's the thing it's if we don't realize what what Tico is showing us we're, we're doomed there's not a question about that um you know so when i when i say it's the most important thing in the world to understand i mean that sounds like oh i'm being melodramatic and what an exaggeration not at all it, you know, the, the Watiko mind virus, it underlies every form of destruction we're acting out, whether it's nuclear potential for nuclear war or climate change or, you know, the political malfeasance or the, the economic meltdown or just the evil that's playing out both individually in our relationships, you know, collectively in the world. The Watiko mind virus is the very root and the source of that evil of the collective madness and um it, it was in it's in the bible it's in every spiritual tradition in the the apocryphal text of the bible they talk about um this counterfeiting spirit and the way they describe this counterfeiting spirit is exactly Precisely, I wouldn't change a word in describing Watiko, but interestingly, it got edited out of the Bible because I would point out that Watiko was on the editorial board of the Bible and made sure that the description of itself was edited out of the Bible because it can stand to be seen. Watiko, it's a virus of the mind that works through our blind spots. Okay. And it's a form of blindness but it's a special form of blindness 
because it's a form of blindness that doesn't know it's blind and believes it's sighted. And not only that, it believes it's more sighted than people who actually have sight. So in the apocryphal text, they talk about this counterfeiting spirit. Let me just describe what Tico. It actually is an imposter. It actually will mimic us. It will put us on. Putting us on has a double meaning. It means you could say it puts us on like a suit of clothes. So it hides in identification with us and putting us on means to fool us. So it presents us with a false, this limited version of who we are with a fictitious identity. And if we're not awake to it's what it's doing to its wiles, we then in that moment unconsciously identify with its image of who we are. And as soon as we do that, then, and I'll be talking about our incredible creative power that Watiko both hides and plugs into, but it also potentially helps us to recognize once we identify with that fictitious version, as if in a self-fulfilling prophecy, we will then dream up all the evidence we need, both in the world and in our minds, confirming to us the truth of, oh, I'm really wounded and traumatized and oh, my unhealed abuse. And then we'll just draw up all the proof we need, confirming our viewpoint. And, and by identifying with Watiko's fictitious version of who we are, we then actually give ourselves away. We give our power away and we identify with who we're not. And that's a recipe for madness. And that's what Tico. And um, so all of the sacred texts of every tradition, you know, in Hawaiian kahuna, um, just every, you know, that's what my next book is about. They're all creatively articulating this mind virus. And um, so the idea that it, you know, it is the counterfeiting spirit. And what it'll do, it'll, because it's a mind virus, it will actually plug into our mind because it has no creativity in and of itself. Okay. And, um, but it plugs into our own creativity in such a way that it turns our own creative genius against us in a way that then serves its agenda and it kills us. It's like a tapeworm where that when it gets into your body, the tapeworm will start to secrete chemicals in which you'll start craving food. And you think you're acting on your own impulse, but you're actually feeding the tapeworm. So it grows bigger and you're the host until it kills you. But it doesn't want to kill you too soon or it'll suffer the inconvenience of having to find another host. Okay. So I'm just creatively describing Watiko from as many ways as I can imagine, because like I'm saying, it's a form of blindness. It works through the projective tendencies of the mind in such a way that we literally bewitch ourselves. We enchant ourselves, we hypnotize ourselves, we trick ourselves out of our own mind. Because the situation is as follows in our world situation. We are creative beings. We are these geniuses. We are these creative geniuses. And if you think, oh, no, I'm not creative at all, well, guess what? Then you've, like, accessed your creative genius to create a very self-convincing experience that you're not creative. And then you'll identify with that, and you'll have all the proof you need that you're not creative. And that itself is an expression of your incredible creativity, that you've created that experience of not being creative. And that's an example of how Watika will plug into your, creati to your creativity and turn it against you. Okay? So what I'm basically saying... And it's not just me. This isn't just, oh, I have this wild, radical, out there theory. I'm just, like I said, a translator of indigenous wisdom, Native American wisdom, Buddhist wisdom, Islam, Christianity, mystical Christianity. This is exactly what Christ was talking about. So our situation is, is that we have this creative agency, this creative genius, that to the extent we don't constructively express it, 
it gets turned against us. And, um, and you know, individually that then hurts us, but writ large when we're collectively doing that as a species, you know, we're enacting collective suicide. I mean, that's an expression of the collective psychosis because Watiko is, a, it's a psychic epidemic. It's a collective psychosis. You know, it's the real deadly pandemic that's happening in the world today. And um, so the thing about Watiko, it's a quantum phenomena. And, and you know, I wrote a book about quantum physics because it, it so was helpful for me to articulate the experience that I began having when I was having my awakening. I was experiencing stuff that was physically impossible, or at least what I had been taught was physically impossible. I was experiencing stuff that can only happen in a dream. And I was beginning to realize the dream like nature. Now, Watiko is a dreamed up phenomena. There's no objective thing called Watiko. If people are getting you know, fearful about hearing my talk about, oh, there's this deadly mind virus. No, 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 that's a misunderstanding. There's no such thing as Watiko. It doesn't exist, okay? And yet it can kill us. See, that's the paradox. It has no independent existence whatsoever, separate from our own mind. And yet, if we don't recognize what it's revealing to us, it will kill us as programmed. You know, that's its program. And what that's pointing at is the incredible power of our own creativity. That if Watiko didn't exist, we would have to invent it. It's that it's it's the greatest catalyst for our evolution that there's ever been. Okay, but it's a it's a particular type of evolutionary agent in that instead of like with a virus, with a typical virus, we'll develop you know whatever vaccines or antibodies or whatever you know we do to counter the virus, and the virus will change and do you know mutation. Watiko forces us to mutate. Okay, and um, it forces us to evolve. Now, the thing about Watiko is that, so it's a mind virus. It's a psycho-spiritual disease of the soul that works through the projective tendencies of the mind. And it's so psychoactivating when you realize um, what it's showing us, okay? Like I've had, um, you know, I've had people, groups of people interested in, in, oh, what is this Watiko thing? We hear about Watiko and I start to explain it. And after like one minute, they'll say, oh, we get it. We understand. And I'm at that point, instead of them getting Watiko, Watiko has gotten them because they might understand the slightest 0.00001% of Watiko and they think they got the whole thing. It's so multidimensional and it's so mind blowing and it's so psychedelic when you realize what it's showing us because it's a revelation and it's a revelation it's a dreamed up phenomena we've literally dreamed up what you go into the world into our minds and it's killing us it's at the root of all the destruction the self and the other destruction that we're acting out but if we don't recognize what it's what it's revealing to us you know it will it will kill us so what Tico, it's it's a magical it has a magical superhero power it's a psycho-spiritual disease of the soul. It's a virus of the mind. And yet it's able to express itself somehow by synchronistically configuring events in the outer world so as to play itself out. Now, just think about what I just said. It's an inner disease of the psyche that elaborates itself and explicates itself through arranging events in the outside world, through the medium of the outside world. So that means that one of the ways to see Watiko is to recognize that what's playing out in the world is actually an outer reflection of our psyche. That what is happening in the outer world is this mirror reflecting what's happening inside of us. Now, in the apocryphal text, got written out of the Bible, but Christ says, yeah, when you recognize the inner as the outer, that's when you enter the kingdom. And um, what I'm describing 
where the outer environment is reflecting the inner state of the psyche, that's a dream. You see, Watiko, it's, an, it's a dreamed up phenomena. We're dreaming it up together because we don't know how not to. But we're dreaming up Watiko in our world so as to learn how to not do it, which is completely within our power. Okay, so Watiko is an expression of the dreamlike nature. And it's revealing the dreamlike nature that it's actually expressing. And so one of that is to say one of the ways of really seeing Watiko, because Watiko works through our blind spots. As long as we don't see it, it has power over us. Once we see it, it has no power. So it will do everything in its tool bag through its non-local connections to the world to obfuscate itself, to hide itself. As soon as we become onto it, it wants to, it shapeshifts and distracts us or takes a different form. So what I'm pointing at, my whole work is about pointing at Watiko. I mean, it reminds me of a dream I had a number of years ago. And in the dream, uh, it was the morning that two of my teachers, these great Tibetan lamas were coming to visit me. So I think I had a lot of you know, excitement, you know, just uh, a lot of energy. And I got woken up the morning I was about to pick them up from the airport with the following dream. And in the dream, like me and a bunch of friends, we were on the lookout for this, for this, you know, vampiric figure. And we were actually chanting Bella Lugosi, Bella Lugosi, the actor who played, played Dracula. And we were all on the lookout for Dracula. And then I see him. And I try to let my friends know, I see him, there he is. And no one else can see him. And then I wake up and that dream was, I don't know, 25 years ago or something. And um, what I want to say is that I've done active imagination on that dream in my life in that that is a way of describing my my work. And that in that I've developed, you know, way more fluency in pointing out the vampire because Watiko is a vampire in a way that actually can help people to see it. OK, and that's the medicine you see the thing about watiko it's a quantum phenomena encoded secretly hidden within the pathogen of watiko the vampire of watiko is the vaccine is the medicine that's what i mean that i say it's a quantum phenomena there's a superposition of states just like light is either a wave or a particle depending on how we observe it watiko contains the deepest evil imaginable and the most greatest blessing we could ever imagine. It's literally helping us to wake up. It's helping to connect us with our creative agency and power. And when I say Watiko is a vampire, yeah, think about a vampire. You know, it feeds off of our, off of us, off of our life force. And that's exactly Watiko. A vampire can't live on its own. It doesn't have any independent existence. It needs living beings who, so it's a form of death that takes on life by feeding on life a vampire. And that's Watiko. There are a lot of different ways of describing Watiko. It's a vampire, it's a mind virus, it's a parasite, a tapeworm. Just like when you get close to this, to this mystery, typ typically when somebody has this miracle-like energy, there are a number of names for it. There are a number of different ways of describing it. And that's pointing at that one name doesn't do it, it you know, it doesn't do justice to the miracle-like quality of that particular thing. And that's what I'm trying to point at with Watiko. I'm continually circumambulating it, describing it in different ways, you know, so as to help people to see it. Because as long as we don't see it, it can act itself out through our unconscious. We unwittingly, think about it, we all have an unconscious and we all act out our unconscious. Who hasn't done that, you know? And um, with the best of intentions even. And the idea being that if we aren't doing our work on integrating our shadow, both personal and archetypal, to the best of our ability. And um, just like, you know, unexpressed creativity is the greatest poison in the human psyche. 
when we're at the point in our process of um, something is emerging into consciousness and we need to look at it, if we decide to not look at it, um, that avoidance of becoming conscious, that's incredible poison. That feeds Watiko, because Watiko, being a form of blindness, actually it feeds on when we turn a blind eye. Okay. And now Watiko, another way, another few ways of understanding Watiko are with trauma. It informs, it's at the root of trauma, and I'll explain, and also when people have addictions. Because trauma and addictions, to me, really interpenetrate and, and at a certain point are hard to separate. So just think about trauma. Think So here we are, we're a species in trauma. I've written about that. You know, we all have um, PTSD. And, you know, even before the coronavirus thing, we were a species in trauma. And, you know, the way I've discovered this work is I was so unbelievably traumatized by what played out in my encounter with Watiko, you know, without going into the story, that there is a way that I carried the trauma over decades, 24-7. It was either going to kill me, and I'm still a work in progress, you know, in, in, in understanding and integrating, you know, the revelation that came my way and the depth of the trauma. But one way to understand Watiko is by really contemplating the nature of trauma. So think about it. In trauma, something happens in our life, historically in time, that we can't integrate in the normal way. It's overwhelming to the conscious ego. We, we can't create a symbol for it. We It's just too much to assimilate. So then a part of us splits. So think about here, we're a whole, we get traumatized, a part of us disassociates. And that split off part, if we don't work on integrating it, it will develop a seeming autonomy or a sovereignty of its own, almost like it has an independent will or life of its own. In psychology speak, that's an autonomous complex. That's what the ancients call a demon. And it's another way of describing Watiko. Um, but in trauma, if we don't, you know, integrate that trauma and we become a victim, uh, if we're traumatized, then what happens? Through our actions of trying to actually heal the trauma, we actually generate the trauma we're trying to heal from in a self-perpetuating feedback loop that's utter madness because trauma is a form of madness that we all potentially have. And that's a way of describing Watiko. And, um, but the interesting point is, you see this, this definition I love about of trauma is it's unexperienced experience. So it's like we weren't able to consciously experience something so as to integrate it. So we're continually unconsciously recreating it so as to actually consciously experience whatever it was we weren't able to experience at the moment of trauma, so as to metabolize it, so as to discharge the energy that was bound up in that compulsion to recreate the trauma, the repetition compulsion, that is the symptomology, the pathology of trauma. That's a way of describing Watiko. But encoded in that pathology of trauma is the medicine. You're actually, by unconsciously recreating it, you're trying to actually experience it with consciousness in a way that will free that energy. Like I was saying, that's bound up in the compulsion to recreate the trauma. And, um, and the same thing, you know, with addiction. You see, the thing about Watiko, one of the things it does, see, there are all these, these qualities of it. One is that when somebody is really afflicted with Watiko, we accuse others of doing what we ourselves are unconsciously doing. Okay, that's one way of telling, oh, that's the, the spore print of Watiko. One other fingerprint of it is that, oh, when we see ourselves acting out stuff, that is a, that's against our own best interests. When we, for example, support politicians whose, you know, policies are going to hurt us, or, you know, we'll just act out stuff like an addiction, you know, on one level, if you act out the behavior, you're going to regret it. And yet you do it. And, you know, so in, in other words, you're enacting your own destruction. That's, you know, who's at the bottom of that? That's Watiko. 
you know. Now, um, a way of explaining the psychological dynamic that underlies Watiko is as follows. Because they're all, you know, it's a has a psychological component, has a spiritual component. And it's not something esoteric. I mean, it's like we all have Watiko. You see, if, if I see somebody, say whoever, whatever politician or leader, and if they, um, you know, say, because the thing about Watiko, it's an archetypal, daimonic, transpersonal energy. What that means in essence, in real simple terms, is that it's an energy that can possess a person, an ego. It can take us over and we then act it out. And if we see somebody acting out Watiko, whatever politician, for example, and if we think, oh, well, they're possessed by Watiko, and, um, you know, and if we think that they have it and we don't, then that point of view is evidence that we ourselves have fallen under the thrall of Watiko because it feeds off of fear and separation. But if we in seeing, oh, they have Watiko, and they're actually a dream character reflecting back our own, that part of ourselves that has Watiko that's under the spell, then we're beginning to recognize the dreamlike nature. Then we're beginning to see through the illusion of the separate self. Then that's to begin to wake up. And that point of view heals Watiko. Okay. And, um, and then, you know, when people get together who are under the spell of Watiko, who really you know, unwittingly are instruments, they're going to attract other people who are under the spell in a similar way. And they're all going to reinforce each other's madness in a sense that that's a, a simple way of understanding when there's a collective psychosis. And imagine if, if millions or billions of people are like that. And then any reflection from the outside world that's shedding light on their madness will get in a perverse way interpreted to confirm their crazy point of view so they're not able to self-reflect, which is another form of madness. Just like, you know, with evil, we can't really self-reflectively think about ourselves. So the thing about Watiko is that um, it totally has to do with the profound importance of shedding light on evil. Like evil people who are just, you know, new agey, magical thinking people, they can be really smart, really well-intentioned. Oh, I don't want to deal with... Um, with evil, I don't want to put my attention on it because then it will um, feed it. Well, yeah, there's some truth to that. If we don't, if we get too fascinated by evil, well, then we're feeding it. If you remember, I said Watiko doesn't even exist. When you actually see the dreamlike nature, you know, there is no Watiko from that point of view, you know. But for people who don't, who just become an ostrich and say, oh, no, I'm not going to, there's no evil. I don't want to give it my attention, I don't want to become fascinated by it. Well, if they're acting out of avoiding to look at that evil, they're unwittingly feeding it because what Tico feeds off of us turning a blind eye towards it. But we don't want to become overly fascinated by it because that also feeds what Tico. Okay, I see how Watiko works through the outside world and through my unconscious reactions in my own mind. Now I see you. And being a sovereign being, I get to choose where I place my attention. And I want to place my attention in creating the world I want to live in. That dispels Watiko, you see? So that's the strategy. That's do you know, and then... Um, that plugs into our creative agency. Now, getting back to that psychological dynamic, because there are all these ways that I'm wanting to share that can help us to see, because in essence, our species has fallen blind, okay? Because with Watiko, we, we don't know we're blind. We can't see our own shadow. We don't know the, the darkness. We don't see our own light. And we don't recognize that Watiko is a revelation. There are four, those are the four ignoble blindnesses is the name I gave them sort of as a, as a joke on the four, you know, noble truths of the Buddha. Um, so the blindness has four different aspects. So the psychological dynamic that feeds Watiko, that fuels Watiko is coming from the shadow. 
and coming from when we project the shadow, when we scapegoat. Now think about, just follow with me in your imagination, the idea of what scapegoating is. When we all have a shadow, we have a personal shadow, archetypal shadow, but when we don't deal with our own shadow and we don't wanna own it or look at it, what do we do? We dissociate from it, we split. And split, interestingly, has a double meaning. It means we disassociate and we, we leave. We get out of here, get out of the present moment. And But by splitting from our shadow, the way to understand this is in a dream. Imagine we're in a dream. If I split off from a part of myself, what's going to happen? I'm going to project it out into the dream. And the dream, which is nothing other than this projection, reflection of my own mind, has no choice but to instantaneously reflect back what I've projected out because a dream is nothing other than a projection of my mind. So if I project out my shadow, guaranteed the dream into the dream is going to walk whoever, a person, a group of people, whoever, who's going to be the carrier of my projection. They're going to embody my split off, dissociated, projected out, you know, shadow. And, and they're going to like play it out. They're going to they embody it. So now look at what's happened now. So I projected out my shadow. Now somebody out there is carrying and playing out the projection. Now I have all the evidence I need to confirm to myself that the shadow, the evil really exists out there. And, and then I'm identified just with the light because the evil's out there. It has nothing to do with me. And, um, and then what happens when you amplify that, just like when you amplify a dream, you then will eventually try to get rid of, to exterminate, to destroy, to kill the carry of your shadow, which is this dramatization and external playing out of the initial inner process of trying to exterminate and get rid of your own shadow. So take a look at what's just happened. Your inner process of dissociating and trying to get rid of your own shadow, you're then unwittingly unconsciously playing out through the medium of the outside world. And by doing that, look at what's happened. By trying to destroy the projected evil that you're seeing out there, you literally have become possessed by the very evil that you're trying to destroy. That's what Tico, okay? And of course, they're probably doing, trying to do the same for you. And what I'm describing, that scapegoating, that shadow projection, that's the psychological dynamic that's informing all of the polarization in the world's body politic and informing and giving shape to all of the war and the, the killing and the hatred. You know, and all of that fuels Watiko. It gorges on that stuff. It's a feast for Watiko. You see, because the thing about Watiko, it doesn't exist. It has no independent existence, which means we have to become clear. How are we colluding with it? We're dreaming it up. Where are we complicit in our own lives of turning away from our own shadow, of not being authentic? You see, the thing about Watiko, because I can go on for hours about this, because it's a never-ending realization. It's a revelation that just keeps on giving, you know? It's like taking some sort of plant medicine, a psychedelic that just comes on and never stops coming on. It just, it just endlessly explicates itself. That's what I'm trying to get across. That you see, the thing about it's 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 a saving idea. It's it's a symbolic idea. Jung talks about in times of collective psychosis. We it's always a new symbolic idea, a saving idea that saves humanity. That's what Watiko is. And, and, and ideas are the way we envision reality. Ideas, they're not just these, these, these immaterial sort of amorphous things. No, they actually give shape and form to how we interpret our experience. Because you see, we have this incredible creative agency of how um, we shape reality. So I just want to bring in, you know, I wrote a book about quantum physics and quantum physics is providing us the medicine for Watiko. You know, we have everything we need to heal Watiko, both in ourselves and in the world. So just let me say um, a little bit about quantum physics because it's so mind blowing. So here I had this 
experience in 1981, the spiritual awakening got me in a lot of trouble. I got, like I said, hospitalized, diagnosed, medicated. And, you know, and then it took me a while to realize, oh, instead of that, you know, kind of getting in the way of my awakening, no, that was part of the awakening. That was my descent into the underworld. I could not believe the insanity that was taking place in the mental health system and the abuse. It was unbelievable. I never would have imagined, never would have believed it in a million years until I experienced it. And um, so then, you know, for years I've been studying quantum physics and at a certain point I just went so down the rabbit hole because I realized, oh my God, quantum physics is describing the very world that I had like gotten propelled into the dreamlike nature. Because I was realizing we're having a collective dream, not metaphorically, not, oh, this is like a dream metaphorically. No, this is a dream. Just like you can have a this lucid dream at night and recognize your dreaming. That's the nature of our situation right now. Okay. We're having a collectively shared dream, but because we don't know it, we're dreaming it up in this incredibly problematic, you know, death creating way. So quantum physics, let me just say a few words about that as um, the medicine for Watiko. As you know, not it's the medicine, it's one of many medicines for Watiko. So before quantum physics came on the scene, we scientists thought that this universe existed objectively and we were just passive observers, just trying to understand how it worked. And, but we had nothing to do with it. We were just, you know, just observing an objectively existing world. And then in essence, quantum physics came along and just blew apart that idea that the idea of that this world exists objectively separate from us is just that, an idea in our mind with no Carlin in reality whatsoever. So in other words, the rug got pulled out from under, you know, the physicist conception of who the, they thought they were and where they existed relative to the world and the nature of the world. There, the whole conception of everything got turned on its head. So by pointing out that there is nothing objective, what quantum physics is basically saying is that the act of observing actually influences the universe observed, that the observer the thing observed and the act of observation are interrelated, interconnected, inseparable parts of one quantum system. There's no separate parts interacting. Because in a quantum world, in this world, quantum physics has discovered is quantum through and through on every scale, on the micro and the macro. By being a quantum world through and through, there, it's a seamlessly whole world. There's no separate parts. There's no separate beings interacting. This is all being a quantum world. We're all, there's a wholeness. And the act of observing the universe, influencing the universe, that's an expression of a dream. You can't get more accurately describing the nature of a dream. Think about it. You're in a dream. You change your perception. The dream has no choice but to reflect back and spontaneously shape shift and reflect back that change in perception because the dream is nothing than, other than your own mind. So quantum physics discovered, for example, that the way we set up an experiment, ask the questions, interpret the data actually determines the answer we get back. That the way we observe this universe actually affects the universe we're observing, which is to say, and here's the mind blowing aspect of it is that the act of observation is creative. Okay. Quantum physics has discovered 100%, no question about it, that this universe is a dream. Now, there's no question that quantum physics is the greatest discovery ever in all of history. No one who knows anything about quantum physics will deny that in the realm of science. It's the greatest discovery, okay, ever. But there's no debate about that. But the debate is what does it mean? What is it's all controversial? And I'm pointing out that because the quantum physicists who discovered it are saying, we still haven't discovered the central idea. It should be there's such a simple underlying idea to quantum physics that we should be able to describe it in five words or on a on a T-shirt or on a bumper sticker. You know, and until we discover, until we really get the central, simple main idea, we don't really understand quantum physics. So I'm not a physicist at all. You know, I'm just somebody who's been kind of going through my own process, trying to heal. And, and, but I'm basically saying, yeah, the central main 
simple idea of quantum physics is that this is a dream. It's 100% guaranteed proven that, you know? And these physicists are going to say, they always, they say like, yeah, when we realize this idea, we're going to think, how could we have been so blind? Blind, what he goes of blindness. So I'm pointing out that that is the central idea of quantum physics, that we're having a dream. And when you realize that the act of observation is creative, just like a dream, it unlocks the most unbelievably infinite creative energy. I mean, think about what I'm doing right now. I haven't prepared for this talk. I've no, I'm as interested to, to hear what's going to come out of my mouth as all of you. But instead of like, oh, I have to memorize or prepare or whatever. No, I just like plug into my creative nature and just allow it to express itself through me. Because that's what quantum physics is unlocking. You see that this is the solution to all the myriad world crises is for us individually and then connecting with other people who are accessing and plugging into our creative genius. It's completely available to us. There's nothing stopping us from doing that. Okay. And quantum physics is literally showing us this. It, it, by, it's showing, by showing us there's no objective world. There's no objective anything. There's not even things. The idea of things being existing separate, that's an abstract idea. That's a construct. So what quantum by quantum physics actually proving that there's no objective world out there, it's shedding light on the subject, on us, because we as a subject need an object to be in relationship to in order to be a subject. If there's no object, if, there, if there's nothing objective, what happened to the subject? In other words, quantum physics is promoting itself to become a spiritual path. And it's pointing out, it's asking the question, it's shedding light on who are we in all of this? One of the founding fathers of quantum physics actually said, yeah, the real task, the fundamental task of science is to answer the question, who am I? Okay. Now, keep in mind, quantum physics is, is so radical. I mean, it was discovered a century ago. You see, in Buddhism, I just this is so unbelievable. They're the tradition of Buddhism. You see, I do Buddhist practice by my shrine in back of me. The tradition I do practice to, there's a, there's a thing called terma. Terma is the hidden treasures. And it's the way the lineage propagates itself and keeps itself fresh. That the idea is there are these hidden treasures that are hidden within the multidimensional fabric of this universe, in the earth, in our minds, and something just like in a dream. When you're in a dream and you don't know you're dreaming, you don't know the nature of your situation and something will happen in the dream and you'll recognize you're dreaming and you'll have this lucid dream. All of a sudden something will happen in our world, in your life, like with these hidden treasures, they'll say the person who's destined to discover them, they might see one syllable and that syllable will awaken uh, 20 volumes of text that have been secretly hidden and coded within their minds. And the idea of a hidden treasure is right when the tradition gets a little bit stale or one-sided or it needs some inspiration, all of a sudden somebody will discover a hidden treasure you know, a particular, you know, blessed object or a practice or a prayer, something that has like this blessing power to it that has a potency. And then the person who discovers it, they have to actualize and have the realization of the blessing power. And these hidden treasures are designed to be shared with the community. They're a dreamed up phenomena. Okay. And it's exactly like when you have a dream and if you get one-sided, and off center, what happens? Your unconscious will send you a dream with symbols that are compensatory, that'll bring you back into balance. That's the idea of these hidden treasures, okay? They're like alarm clocks that are hidden and coded within the fabric of the universe to go off to wake us up, right, when we need them, okay? Now, I gave a big talk, I don't know, you know, one and a half years ago or something, in which I was basically presenting that quantum physics is an analog to a modern day terma, that it's a hidden treasure that we as a species have literally dreamed up into the world and we've dreamed up into our minds so as to help us to awaken, so as to help us to dispel with Tico. 
okay? And what I'm pointing at is that quantum physics, by showing us that there's nothing objective, that this universe doesn't exist separate from us in a solid objective form, that becomes the medicine for Watiko. Now, quantum physics is so profound, like I think of with Albert Einstein, one of the founders of quantum physics, one of the founders, one of the founding fathers, and he literally could not wrap his mind around the profundity of what it was showing. He openly, this is in my opinion, he openly confesses it. He was attached to the viewpoint that this world existed objectively. You see, quantum physics is showing that our perception is a key factor in the equation of the universe, which is to point that that we have this unimaginably vast creative genius and power and agency inside of us that because we either don't know that or we don't know how to use that agency, we're destroying ourselves. What I'm pointing out in my work is that, hey, what if we actually, it's like we have this magic wand from the heavens, this talisman, this incredible like superhero power. What if we actually recognize that we already possess it and then we can figure out how to use it so I'll give you an example of um, this unbelievable creative power. I mean, this is, it, it's just, I, I can go on forever about this because like I'm saying, it is the solution to the myriad world crises. Okay. But it all depends on if it's one thing for one person to have this realization and then, oh, their life will become better and amazing and they'll manifest stuff and blah, blah, blah. That's insignificant. The point is, is that what if, what will happen when more and more of us have this realization and connect with each other, we can activate our collective genius together. We can conspire to co-inspire each other. That's a true conspiracy theory. We can dream ourselves awake. That's what this is all about. We actually realize that we play a participatory role in our own evolution. And until we realize that, until we actually recognize and take responsibility for that and step into that and then connect with other people who are also realizing that, you know, unless we do that, things don't look good, you know, but there's no, there's no reason to feel um, pessimism or despair at all. I mean, and quantum physics, once again, I mean, one of the quantum physicists says, yeah, when he gets depressed, he listens to, to Mozart or he studies quantum physics. It's the best antidepressant there is. You know, it's the medicine for Watiko. Because think about quantum physics for a moment. So it's the trying to understand the building blocks, the really the microstructure of this universe. And as it went more and more down into these quantum elementary particles, it discovered consciousness. That consciousness was where it's never separate from this universe. Just like when it rains out outside and we hear this rainbow, that rainbow is a combination of water and light and our mind. When we see an image of a rainbow, there's no objective rainbow. That image of a rainbow, it exists inside of our mind. Quantum physics is saying that's the nature of this universe. That's the teaching of the Buddha too. He says this universe, this physical universe is like a rainbow. It doesn't exist objectively in the way we've been entrained to think it does. That awareness of the universe is a key factor in our experience of the universe. See, this is pointing at that we have this enormous power to create our experience. We have this enormous power to create this experience of ourselves and our experience of the world. So just imagine, imagine in a dream and imagine you have this lucid moment and you've stabilized that and you're recognizing you're dreaming. Oh my God, this dream I'm in, which I thought was real and solid and objective, it's actually my own mind. It's my own energy. I'm inside of my psyche. And imagine in that lucid dream, you connect with other of your dream characters, aspects of yourself. And you actually put your realization together. Wow, we're all, you know, say if they also are, are you know, be, having this lucidity and you, you contemplate what you're realizing, oh my God, this shared universe that we're all inhabiting, 
is just a function of our unconscious dreaming. It's manifesting the way it is because we've been conditioned and programmed to dream it up in this limited way. When you connect with other people in that dream, and this is just imagination, right? You realize you can change the dream. Well, that dream that I was just describing, that night dream, that's this dream. That's the nature of our situation, okay? Because when you actually wake up to who you are, you realize, wait a second. You see, Watiko, one simple way of understanding Watiko, it's to fall under the Ill, Ill illusion, the imagination of thinking you exist as a separate self. Before I found the word Watiko, I wrote a book about Watiko, didn't know the name. I called it Malignant Egophrenia, ME disease, ME disease. It's a misidentification of who we think we are. That's Watiko. When you identify with a separate self, that doesn't even exist in the way that you're imagining. And then you spend all of your life force and energy protecting and defending. That's madness. That's Watiko. And when everybody's doing that, you have a collective psychosis, like we see evidence all around us today. Okay. But when, so the ways to, to sort of, um, to dispel with Tico, to see through the imagination of the separate self, to realize we're interconnected. We depend on each other for our own survival. We're interdependent. There is no separate self. That's to see through the illusion. What Tico doesn't exist. Separate self doesn't exist. Another way of, of seeing Watiko is to see the dream like nature. Oh, we're having a dream. We're dream characters in each other's dreams. And then like one other way, they're all facets of the same jewel. They're not separate, is to see the field, the non-local field that we're all contained in and expressions of. That's the quantum field that we're not separate from. And to see that that quantum field is, express, is expressing itself in a synchronistic way, okay? So the idea being is that once we sort of step out of that spell of thinking we exist in a way that we don't, i.e. the separate self, that all of a sudden, that's poison to Watiko. And then when we hook up and connect with and get in phase with and in sync with other people who are also having that realization, like I've been saying, we can activate our collective genius and dream ourselves awake. So the thing about despair and pessimism is that that's a real danger. It's very convincing that things look really dark and, you know, and, um, you know, and just that we're doomed or things are going to get way worse and we're killing ourselves, you know, collectively. But quantum physics is saying, no. Think about what, what quantum physics is showing us. You have a quantum entity and before it's observed, it exists in a state of of potentiality of any and every state it could possibly ever exist in. And then along comes an observer, we observe that quantum entity and it actualizes into one particular actual manifestation. And all the other potentialities vaporizes if they never existed, they go into a parallel world, so to speak. What that means, that means that even if one of those potentialities and um, to quote a physicist, even if it's highly, ridiculously unlikely and improbable, that could be the universe that manifests this very next moment. Okay, so an example being, what if our species actually awakens? What if, you know, and, and the, I, the perfect image is when, when you dissolve sugar in a, in a glass of water, the sugar will just dissolve and dissolve and dissolve. And then you reach the saturation point. You add one more grain of sugar and a crystal manifests. Any one of us having the realization of Watiko, owning our shadow, seeing the dreamlike nature, having the realization of their Buddha nature, their Christ nature, however you call it, just any one of us at maybe even at this moment, expanding our consciousness just the slightest little bit and self-reflecting might be that grain of sugar that catalyzes a global awakening in the entire collective field, okay? Quantum physics is saying that's possible. If we're not thinking that, and if we're caught in pessimism in despair, then like, what are we thinking? Then we're part of the problem. Then we're colluding with the Watiko epidemic, okay? 
to give you a sense of what I'm pointing out about the creative genius. So imagine that you're in a dream and imagine whatever viewpoint you're holding in the dream and the dream being a reflection of your mind is just, you know, instantaneously just reflecting back your, your viewpoint, right? And so now you have all the evidence that what you're seeing objectively exists because the world is just, if you think that it objectively exists, the world will just reflect back, you know, as if it objectively exists because it is nothing other than your own mind just reflecting back to itself. So then now that you have all the evidence you need in that, in that dream of the correctness of your viewpoint, you become even more fixed and entrenched in that viewpoint. So you even become more entrenched in thinking you're relating to an objective world. And the more you think that the world is objective, the more the world will convincingly manifest to you as being objective. And then you have even more evidence to entrench and, you know, entrench you in your viewpoint ad infinitum. What I'm describing, that's the sake, that's our sacred power of, you know, creating a dream of dreaming. And, but, if we don't know we're dreaming, if we don't know the nature of our situation, if we don't know the immense creative power we have, what I'm describing, we've hypnotized ourselves thinking that dream world, which doesn't have any objective existence, exists objectively, then we react to it. Then we become conditioned by our reactions. Then we become entranced and we be, we've put ourselves under a spell. There is no one else who's done that we have actually hypnotized ourselves and put ourselves under a spell. That's what you go. Okay. That's what we're playing out because we don't realize we're the dreamer of the dream. We're getting dreamed up by the dream and in a synchronistic cybernetic feedback loop, we're dreaming the dream. We're all co-dreaming the dream up into materialization. And what I'm trying to point out is trying to transmit to people, Hey, when enough of us wake up to this, we can, in a literal way, change the dream we're having. And that's evolutionary. And that's what this is all about. You see, because the feeling I have is that we've been here before. Maybe we've, we've dreamed up this exact scenario again and again and again, where, you know, we're all on this planet together and we're, you know, creating these catastrophes, you know, with potential nuclear war or, you know, climate change or whatever, and we don't get the message. We don't get what it's showing us because what Tico is literally reflecting back to us, the profound power of the human psyche in creating our experience. And if we don't get the message, we just blow ourselves up, destroy, you know, ourselves. And then, you know, it takes, you know, billions of years and we'll create another universe, another you know, simulation of planet Earth, and you know we're back at the same situation. Which, of course, in 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 a dream, there's it's there's no linear time, so those billions of years might take, you know, the twinkling of an eye, and then you know again and again we just get right to that event horizon and we just destroy ourselves. What if this is the time we actually really have the awareness to receive what the dreaming? how this universe is manifesting, what it's revealing to us. We are having a revelation. Watiko is a revelation. This universe is an epiphany. It's an oracle. It's a dream. And it's speaking in the language of symbols. It's continually reflecting back to us the very thing we need to know. And if we don't recognize that, guaranteed, we're going to continue to destroy ourselves. But if enough of us recognize what's being revealed to us openly and freely, we can literally change the dream we're having. And that's what this is all about. That's what's being offered to us. And that's what my whole life, my whole life is devoted to trying to get that out. Because Watiko, it almost killed me. It destroyed my family. I haven't had a family for over 20 years. You know, I have a huge soul family, a lot of friends and stuff. Um, but um you know, it was an unbelievably harrowing encounter with the forces of darkness. And yet I've been able to extract that there was an incredible gift in the encounter. And hopefully that's informed my work. 
when you realize the dreamlike nature, and this is the most important thing, is when you have the realization of the collective dreamlike nature and you see through the illusion of the separate self, the energetic expression of that is compassion, is, is great compassion. And that's the Watiko dissolver par excellence. And um, yeah, I'm really glad I didn't forget to say that. Okay, so thank you so much.